figure that out or not. But uh, thank you, Pat. And I do want to thank Pat for her um, tremendous leadership, both regionally and locally here in Marin, in helping us put these programs on. As she said, I'm a fourth district supervisor in Marin County, newly elected last November. And a great deal of the open space we talked about today is David and Bobby talked about are in my district. I'm the ABAG representative on the Board of Supervisors, and I'm really excited to get going with the panel today. I'm going to try and shorten up my part so that they can have more time. And uh, the discussion today on this panel is about the EIR alternatives and then the action plan, action plan and next steps. So Matt Maloney, who you've already been introduced to and has a huge job, both in his daily job at MTC and today, because he gets two panels today. So I'm going to let him start with the EIR alternatives. Thank you, Matt. And a birthday party for a two-year-old later, so that's the best is yet to come. So 10 minutes uh, for uh, an 850-page document with 1,000 pages of uh, appendices, so I'm going to try to do that. Um, we, uh, when we do our RTP SES to Plan Barry 2040, we also prepare um, uh, environmental impact reports for those documents. And so this helps decision makers with information in terms of uh, making a decision uh, that takes into account uh, environmental uh, consequences. And I think many of us are familiar with, with EIRs on sort of site level project level. Um, but lo and behold, we actually do it for these regional plans as well. Um, what we do in these documents, we analyze adverse impacts that may result from implementation of the plan, we disclose and inform MTC and impact decision makers about those impacts. We uh, identify measures that can mitigate impacts. Can't hear me. Hear me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. And we also analyze a reasonable uh, range of alternatives uh, to the proposed plan. These EIRs are programmatic, um, which means that uh, they, are, they tend to be uh, regional in scale, and that's sort of allowed by the law. So what, what that means is that we don't analyze individual site conditions or individual projects in EIRs, but we look at the whole of the plan and the uh, overall collective impact. We look at 14 areas of impact in the draft EIR, um, and if you want, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but they're all there in the number 50. Uh, page doc document, and all the areas of impact identified in the CEQA guidelines are addressed in the document. So as dictated by CEQA, the alternatives analysis provides a comparative assessment of the differences in environmental impact for identified alternatives as compared to the project. So this analysis is looking at four alternatives which were approved by the Commission and the ABEG Executive Board in the December of uh, 2016. So we have our proposed plan, that's Plan Bay Area 2040. We have a no project um, alternative as well, which for the most part, um, you know, we try not to call that a business as usual scenario, but it really doesn't have, it sort of lacks the discretionary funding on transportation. It lacks things like PDAs, no bag, any policy overlays. That's kind of the no project. Main streets and big cities are two alternatives that are carryovers from our scenario process. These have been uh, scenarios that have been living with us kind of since the um, and our commission wanted to carry those over into the EIR. So we're actually looking at those as alternatives as well. Lastly, we have uh, one last alternative called the Environment, Equity, and Jobs Alternative, or uh, the EEJ. And uh, this is an alternative that was uh, presented to us through scoping uh, on the plan, and the commission uh, wanted to also include that. Um, and I'll take, a, I'll take you through kind of some of the differences um, across the alternatives. The proposed plan, obviously, we've talked about PDA-focused land use uh, strategies to increase development potential of PDAs and improve affordability. And, and so let me just talk mostly about Main Streets, Big Cities, and, and EEJ. So what Main Streets does, essentially, is it assigns higher densities in cities sort of throughout the region. So it, it's kind of the alternative, it's one of the alternatives that kind of moves away a bit from the PDA uh, framework. Um, it actually expands current growth boundaries faster than historical trends. So it actually does encroach a bit onto our open space uh, in the region. So that's main streets. Uh, big cities is, is quite different. I, I alluded to it um, earlier. It does assign higher densities and select PDAs and opportunity sites with high transit access. The emphasis in big cities is on the big three cities, not surprisingly. Um, but especially in uh, San Jose and Silicon Valley. 
and that's really where big cities um, is going. There's really a lot more opportunity sites that we're trying to open up for housing down in Silicon Valley, and that's kind of what we were testing through that um, scenario. It also does things like it eliminates office space caps in the city of San Francisco. So San Francisco currently has a proposition that limits that. Big city says, well, what if that were removed? That were removed? So San Francisco could build even more office development. Um, lastly, the EEJ um, assigns higher densities in PDAs, TPAs, and suburban communities with uh, what are called high quality schools and low levels of crime. So this is this whole concept of high opportunity areas. Um, the EEJ is really driven by the equity community. Um, and land use and affordability strategies are, I would say, more aggressive than the proposed plan, uh, especially as in select cities with PDAs and high opportunity cities. So that's sort of an, an overall summary of the alternatives. So we want to look a little bit at the forecasted household growth uh, across those alternatives. So our proposed plans are 2040 numbers uh, and focus on Marin County. So about 111,000 uh, households in Marin County. Again, this is the same numbers that I presented earlier. Um, looking at the no project alternative, uh, that actually would be a 10% increase uh, from the proposed plan. Uh, so we would see in the no project 122,000 households in Marin. Uh, Main Street, and a lot of the other ones are, they're almost rounding errors um, in terms of at least from a regional perspective, um, although I know that, uh, <laughs> that the numbers kind of matter. I mean, 110,000 households in Main Street is a little bit less. Big cities uh, has the lowest amount of growth in Marin, 109,000 households, uh, where the EEJ is a bit of a uptick relative to uh, the proposed plan. And this is sort of a look across the region at all of that. So the, the, the little blue areas are growth from the plan by county across all the alternatives. Um, and you know, Marin is right there, so the third one over. I think the first thing, that red is the growth by alternative by county. I think the first thing you see here is that there's not like a ton of difference uh, between the alternatives. I think one thing I will point you to is that the big cities alternative does have considerably more household growth uh, in Santa Clara County. Um, so that's one area where you kind of see a big difference. Job growth, uh, sort of the same, not a huge amount of difference um, across the alternatives. In terms of the forecasted land use growth footprint, um, in terms of acreage, um, I want to run through some of these numbers. The proposed plan in terms of regional acreage, in terms of the increased growth, uh, land use growth footprint, we're seeing about 18,000 acres region-wide um, we're only seeing 210 acres of that in Marin County. And in terms of acreage of open space impacted by the proposed plan, uh, we're seeing 450 acres regionally, uh, and zero acres in Marin County. I'll take the applause now. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to catch open space here. <laughs> and the plan does that. Um, and then kind of going through some of these other uh, alternatives. Um, the, the no project, there is more the land use growth footprint up here in Marin, 1,500 acres. Main Street's very similar. Big City's a little less, 30, and EEJ uh, about the same. Again, this is the jobs across all the alternatives. A lot of information here, and we'll make all the slides available if you want to dig into this. In terms of transportation across those alternatives, um, Focusing a little bit on what makes Main Street's big, big cities and EEJ different. Main Street's does have more emphasis on roadway capacity. There's more roadway expansion in that alternative. Uh, big cities focuses primarily on transit port capacity, connectivity, serving the three big cities. EEJ um, is kind of interesting. Um, major increases in terms of suburban bus service. Uh, but yet it also eliminates all road expansion projects from the plan. That's the plan. Um, so that's EEJ. Uh, it also incorporates a VMT tax, uh, implementing a two cent per mile vehicle miles travel tax on higher income travelers. We've also got that policy in the EEJ. So let's uh, look a little bit here at forecasting regional travel across those alternatives. Um, the daily VMT in 2015 is about 158 million. Um, these are big numbers. And probably the, the most instructive things to look at for, for average commute trip travel time. Okay, I think that kind of brings it down to the personal level. The, the proposed plan is about 22.6 minutes in 2040. Uh, we see that rise almost three minutes in the no project. 
uh, in the Main Street scenario, it's a little bit more as well. Uh, big cities a little uh, less than EDJ, about the same. So actually, in terms of average commute trip travel time, uh, the plan performs the best out of all the alternatives. Um, you know, in terms of daily vehicle miles, VMT, um, we do see some of the other alternatives performing slightly better. So big cities and EEJ are a little better in terms of VMT. But so I think the important thing to get here is that in terms of VMT, the plan is kind of middle of the pack. But in terms of actually average commute times, um, the plan actually does the best of all the alternatives. And, and that's probably the balanced nature of the investments that we're seeing in the plan. Transit and roadways kind of helping people navigate the congestion a little bit better. Greenhouse will be a one minute um, uh, card here, so I'm going to try to do this in one minute. A little bit on GHG. Uh, so there's many elements out there um, that help us uh, reduce global source emissions. And uh, the plan is only a subset of those strategies out there. So we kind of wanted to walk you through this. The trend line in terms of uh, regional mobile source emissions um, is going up. And that's sort of that dotted line. Um, but then you see in the blue and the red, these are areas really controlled more by planning every 2040, our land use and transportation forecast and the climate issues that we have through uh, the plan. But I think it's important to note that that's only a small slice of what's out there in terms of GHG emissions. There's also regulations on the state and federal level in terms of cleaner fleets. And actually when we do forecasting in our plan, um, we don't, we're not allowed to take that into account via SB 375. So we actually don't look at cleaner fleets in our plan. That's what the law says. But we kind of put a graph here together to put the whole picture together for you. So the green area here are really the clean car standards reductions that we see coming down from state and federal regulations. And that's really the big piece where we see GHG reduced. So overall, the regional level of 35% reduction. This is a summary of the alternatives I'm being told to kind of, um, uh, kind of cut it here. Um, the environmentally superior alternative, I, I want to say the alternatives are very close to one another. Um, we are going to call the big cities the environmentally superior alternative. Um, that is a very marginal difference um, compared to the plan. And when policymakers make these decisions about EIRs, there's a few different things they look at. They look at the project objectives, they look at the goals and targets that we set for the plan. They, of course, look at the EIR and they look at reducing the environmental impacts. But they also look at feasibility as well. Um, so they also look at the, how real is it um, to do with some of these alternatives. Um, we're doing. So we're going to put this question in front of our commission in July. And uh, we're going to be considering this information during our deliberations. Again, public comment period ends on June 1st. So we uh, are taking comments on both the plan and the draft EIR at that time. So that concludes what I want to say on the, on the EIR. I think we're going to take questions at the end after Alex and Brad walk through the action. Bike and Ped, 
Uh, some of the pro types of programs that uh, were discussed earlier during the questions and answers to try to help uh, priority development areas, uh, safe routes to school, and obviously um, street maintenance. Uh, on the regional side, one of the things we invested in uh, that links and is important, I think, to Marin County is the suicide insurance system on the Bay Bridge that receives some of the regional investment. Um, we t uh, this came up earlier, Senate Bill 1. Um, this is obviously big news for transportation funding in California, about $50 billion over the next 10 years, really focused on um, maintaining what we have. So there will be a significant amount of money coming to Marin annually for uh, streets and roads maintenance, about $8 million a year, um, just under $4 million to support Golden Gate buses and ferries, as well as Marin Transit uh, through operations or uh, capital, and also another $4 million to uh, SMART to support the train service. Uh, there's also a program at the state level, the cap and trade program, and that uh, provides uh, funding through various competitive programs. One is uh, through, for transit capital. Another one is more of a formula program that sends money out to the regions uh, or all through the state to the transit operators. And another one that is really focused on um, investments in communities that are building in, uh, affordable housing, so transportation investment and for the affordable housing uh, themselves. In terms of some of the local investments that um, happened through the cap and trade program, 11 million was awarded to SMART to buy more vehicles uh, for, for their um, system that will launch hopefully in the next few months. So those vehicles should arrive uh, by 2018 and allow more frequent service on the system. Um, also, we're in transit. Uh, operators have received about $2 million just to help support transit operations through the cap and trade program and also uh, monies to support uh, bringing uh, the fleets and replacing uh, the buses for the transit system. Um, on the federal funding side, um, in terms of the investment plan for Plan Bay Area, we do look at a lot of uh, federal investment just to maintain and replace the buses and the ferries. Um, that are critical um, in this area. Also, there's 20 million in small starts money that would go to extend SMART uh, down to Larkspur. That's actually been approved, and now we're just waiting for um, the FTA to really uh, be able to release the funds. So hopefully, uh, we are working closely to try to make sure that happens. Um, in terms of the plan and sort of future front federal investment, could really go to uh, help do more improvements on 101 uh, in the Marin Sonoma Narrows area. In terms of some other um, programs on the bridge toll side, um, there's been a lot of investment in all the bridge corridors, but focusing on the Richmond Sanderfeld Bridge, obviously the seismic retrofit project um, and ongoing maintenance in that area. Um, there's been over a billion dollars of investment. Um, also, um, you know, more near term, I guess, is the, all the uh, access improvements that are underway on the Richmond Sanderfell Bridge at a third lane in the eastbound direction, and also to pilot um, bike access um, on the upper deck. Also, there's been bridge tolls to invest in SMART. We've invested about $80 million in SMART. And then also, bridge tolls have really helped to um, uh, construct some of the uh, bike projects locally, such as the Cal Park Hill Tunnel. Uh, the, Cal the Central Marin Ferry Access, and also future improvements in the North South Freeway. All right, so getting to the action plan. Uh, that was your whirlwind tour of uh, funding, so we'll be glad to take more questions on that later. But in terms of the action plan, I did want to kind of orient you to Plan Bay Area. Uh, the action plan is sort of the conclusion of the document, but there are several sections, and I just wanted to walk through that quickly so that when you're looking at the plan, you'll have that sort of understanding of how it's all laid out. In terms of section one, it really talks about the Bay Area today, and this really highlights what we've talked a lot today, that we're really confronting a housing crisis in the Bay Area, so it kind of introduces that, talks about some of the mismatch between supply and demand, some of the barriers uh, to being able to uh, build um, the housing that we need, but it also talks about the legacy of leadership in the region and how in the past we have tackled um, significant challenges um, transportation, we have a, a legacy of self-help, um, also on the environment, um, really being able to protect the Bay and protect open space, and we do have a legacy of leadership here in the Bay Area. Uh, chapter 2 really explains the background for why we do the plan, uh, how we engage the public, and how we set our goals. 
Um, chapter 3 uh, is really about forecasting, um, and so it describes the regional forecast both on that housing um, and job side, as well as the financial resources we have uh, for the plan. And Chapter 4 really delves into more specifics um, of the final preferred scenario. Where are we going to distribute the growth, um, and what are the transportation priorities? So that uh, brings us to section five, which is the action plan. I think a lot of um, this came up earlier in questions in terms of, um, you know, plan Bay, uh, plan Bay Area 2040 really does uh, project that the afford affordability problems will intensify if we don't take corrective steps. So the draft action plan proposes shorter terms over the next four years um, actions for the regional agencies to address issues in, um, in areas where the plan is really falling short and emerging issues that require proactive regional policy solutions. So the action plan focuses on three areas, um, housing, economic development, and resilience. And the action plan is draft, so we really want your input today and we really do think there will be significant changes uh, in the action plan as we move to the final and also um, through input we receive making it uh, more specific as appropriate. So the first focus area is housing. Um, the draft action plan does recommend implementing a regional housing implementation strategy. This strategy would be the main product of a, a soon to be launched uh, Blue Ribbon Committee called CASA. Um, the strategy will likely recommend housing actions that require state involvement, uh, such as raising regional revenues for housing or reducing regulatory barriers to permitting housing. Beyond CASA, the draft action plan also recommends continuing and expanding upon um, some of the funding models we have, such as one Bay Area grant um, that aligns funding priorities with housing performance um, and expand direct investment in affordable housing. Also strengthening policy leadership through enhanced local technical assistance and continuing to collect and share housing data, particularly on opportunity sites, uh, development trends, and local policy examples. Um, so the, another, uh, the, the second focus area of the action plan is really on economic development. Um, and the draft action plan recommends implementing a comprehensive economic development strategy uh, which would be the main product that would result from uh, creating an economic development district um, in the region. And the important thing about this strategy is it will provide recommendations for improving business expansion and retention, workforce training, housing workspace, workspace issues and infrastructure. So really the idea of this economic development um, action plan is we really do need to address the issues that came up earlier with respect to the middle class and we really need to work on um, creating the jobs uh, that we need in this area. So again, it really does focus on middle wage job creation through a goods movement um, cluster analysis and evaluating priority production areas. Um, it also acknowledges that infrastructure um, is key to economic development, uh, recommending increasing affordable transportation access to jobs and increasing revenues to, prefer, to preserve existing infrastructure. So I got the one minute mark, so luckily I'm on the last uh, uh, part of the action plan, but certainly not the least important, probably one of the most important, as we heard earlier, and that is uh, resilience. Um, the draft action plan recommends developing um, a govern governance strategy for implementing a resilience plan, because that's one thing that's really missing, is having someone that's really in charge of looking at this issue of sea level rise and resilience in the region. Uh, beyond governance, the draft action plan recommends providing stronger policy leadership on resilient housing and infrastructure, creating new funding sources for these types of projects, and providing resilient technical services teams. Um, so that kind of um, sums up the action plan. I'm going to turn it over, I hope you can get introduced, but then Brad, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about how the action plan really touches uh, more Thank you, Alex. And Pat and Renee have the action plan on the housing actions that came out to you, if you'd like to have one. So I'd like to um, welcome Brad Paul, Deputy Executive Director of ABAG. He's been there since March 2013. Um, Brad came in.
When I say this word, how many of you know what I mean and have a visual image in your head? Wind cup. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to get into that. I've done that in the past. I'm not going to get there. I'm going to try to get a different image in your head. How many people here go to Johnny Donuts on 4th Street in San Rafael, where I live? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few. The next time you're there, I want you to look across the street. There's a new building there. You won't notice it. So if you're driving down the street, it looks like it's been there for 30 years. But it's three stories high. It's on what used to be a vacant restaurant and parking lot. It's next to Jack Hunt Automotive. It's three stories high. It has ground floor retail, so the restaurant that was there went out of business will be replaced by more retail. And I haven't seen it yet, but given the size, it's probably 10 to 20 units. And I think the important thing is when you drive by Highway 101, can't miss one. Um, and when you drive by it on the city streets, you can't miss it. But you will miss this building. It's one of my favorite new buildings in Marin. But that's the image that I think we should have in our minds from Marin. Something that fits into the character of these communities, that looks like it's been there for 30 years, but provides both new housing and jobs. And there are lots of places, not just in San Rafael, but in the Valley and all the other communities around us, where something in that general scale would fit. When I say this word, how many of you know what I mean and have a visual image in your head? Wind cup. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to get into that. I've done that in the past. I'm not going to get there. I'm going to try to get a different image in your head. How many people here go to Johnny Donuts on 4th Street in San Rafael, where I live? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few. The next time you're there, I want you to look across the street. There's a new building there. You won't notice it. So if you're driving down the street, it looks like it's been there for but it's three stories high. It's on what used to be a vacant restaurant and parking lot. It's next to Jack Hunt Automotive. It's three stories high. It has ground floor retail, so the restaurant that was there went out of business will be replaced by more retail. And I haven't seen it yet, but given the size, it's probably 10 to 20 units. And I think the important thing is when you drive by Highway 101, you can't miss one. Um, and when you drive by it on the city streets, you can't miss it. But you will miss this building. It's one of my favorite new buildings in Marin. But that's the image that I think we should have in our minds from Marin. Something that fits into the character of these communities, that looks like it's been there for 30 years, but provides both new housing and jobs. And there are lots of places, not just in San Rafael, but in the Valley and all the other communities around us, where something in that general scale would fit. And I think the, the key to it is we plan for these things. But I think it's as residents and as city leaders, we need to find who built them and invite them to come to our community and build more of those because that's your best defense against criticism that you're not doing anything, but more importantly, against losses, is to have housing that actually works. And let me give you a couple of examples. Ones that would fit in and not cause a huge outburst politically in each of your communities. Another one is what Nevada has done with accessory dwelling units. Many people would like to have an extra unit, as Bobby was talking about, the number of kids, kids there are people now, at college age, up to about 25, who are moving back home. I have friends who have an apartment down below where they live, and that separation is critical to their sanity and their children being able to coexist with their parents. And I think those of you who have children in the safe group know what I'm talking about. But it also opens up opportunities that as you age, as my wife and I, we have a very nice house we bought two years ago in San Rafael. And my son lives with us. But at some point in the future, we, we may want to move out of there into something that's a little more manageable as we get older, but to be able to do it on our own lot and allow some young family to move into our house. And in many cases, for people, that could provide real supplemental income for their retirement. We need to make that easier, not harder. And Nevada has led the way not only in accessory dwelling units that are detached, but what they call junior accessory units within the house. And so those are things that I think really are important for us to look at is the best practice for the entire Bay Area. Two other quick examples. What we now call acquisition rehab. One of the ways to stop displacement is not to build 100 units of affordable housing in the community, but to find a building that's 100 units now that is affordable by nature, but will eventually gentrify and drive those people out. So think of this, the canal neighborhood in San Rafael. There are lots of apartment buildings there that are generally affordable for now. If someone goes in there, nonprofit or a developer and buys one of those buildings and says we're going to keep it affordable. And it won't all be the same income. It'll be people at 40, 60, 80, maybe 100% of the median. 
So there's a mix there, but it's not going to go to market rate and displace all those people. But I think we should be able to get Rena credit for that, because but for that intervention, those units will become unaffordable. If you preserve them forever at these different income levels, you should get credit for that. And that's one of the things that we can do going to Sacramento and we'll talk about. Another example is conversion. There are commercial buildings in each of your communities that are not being used and for whatever reason are not likely to be used soon. If you convert those to you know, a cafe downstairs and some housing upstairs, you're not changing the physical environment in your community, but you're adding some else. And finally, worker housing. You've heard all day about people having to commute out of the area. Imagine any one of your communities a building that's two stories high, there's a restaurant among the downstairs tenants, and the restaurant stores supplies upstairs. If you went to the federal government or used government money to fund a conversion of those units upstairs, updating those and writing them out, under fair housing law, which is there for a good reason, you'd have to do a lot of it. And people from all over the region would apply. And people that need affordable housing would get their own place. But if we had a different model where you went to a foundation, and there are a number of them here, or if an individual wants to make a difference, and said, if you put up money for a fund to let business owners renovate those upper units without government money. If a restaurant could offer three of those five units to their workers, people who are now driving in across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, if you want to stop GHG and reduce it, have people walk a flight of stairs down to the job and have to work all the way down. There are problems to doing that, but there are creative solutions that we can work with you on to make it happen. So I want to not have us focus on wind cut as much, but look at in each of your communities, what are the ways that you can add housing, add jobs, that will reduce DHD, that will get us the benefits we're trying to get in this plan? And I think the good news is that actually it's not just Matt and I who live in the There are a number of people, senior managers at ABAG and MTC who live in the And so what I'd be happy to do is if there's anybody here who wants to talk more about some of these ideas, I live a few miles up the road, I'd be happy to have a cup of coffee with you in your community, walk around your community and talk about these ideas. So we have staff at both AVAC and MTC that can help you figure out how to do those things to make those changes in your community that fit within the character, the scale, and the needs of each of your communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. So we're going to move the question. I want to remind you that you can make your statements and comments on this form. If you want to keep it to the questions, we can get many more done. So. We'll start with questions, and Pat and Renee are out there. So. And Dave is the first question. Can you see me now? Um, so, thank you so much for talking about the needs within Marina. I have two questions for you. Number one, I'm all for counting preservation towards the Rena numbers, but the, res the, the problem with that is the Rena numbers only project for future needs. It doesn't allow for the current needs. So if the RENA numbers were adjusted to account for the needs of the disparate impacts on high versus low income residents and jobs, by all means, preservation should definitely be counted. But right now, it only accounts for future growth, which means that we need more housing to account for future growth. And preservation doesn't quite meet that. So I'd like to see what you could say about that, please. The second issue is that I'm also all for ADUs and JDUs. However, you talk about data gaps. And right now, we don't know how many, who lives there, what the restrictions are, what the rents are, whether or not they abide by fair housing numbers, or whether or not they are rented to affordable people, and people who need affordable housing, and at what level. So if JDUs and ADUs are going to be part of the solution, which I highly, strongly commend, they also need to be part of the data. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think for the, uh, I'm not suggesting that people meet their entire arena numbers with either accessory dwelling units or assisted living, which is also difficult to count. Just that we look at what percentage, there are a lot of small percentage now, I think it's, you can count each one as a quarter of a unit. Maybe that needs to change to half a unit. So we can talk about that. On the, the what uses, I agree with you, we need the data, and I think we have ways more and more now, ways of doing that. And both ABAG and MTC is working on ways to do that on an annual basis and have updated databases for that. 
But I'll, I'll mention another word. How, how many people deal with Airbnb in your community? Um, a few hands up there. This is something that San Francisco is wrestling with. And this is how some uh, accessory dwelling units are used, which is basically turned into hotels. And if you have a room in your house and you want to rent it out, or even an accessory dwelling unit, occasionally when nobody's there, I think that's what the purpose is. But when people start buying houses and renting them out 24 7 as hotels and residential neighborhoods, that's where the problem, or ADUs. So I think each of the communities, and I know you got their, your planning departments have a, uh, an email uh, network to talk about this, because I've gotten a request for does anybody know how other communities are dealing with what are the best practices? There are very real and important things that Airbnb can do in communities and there's problems that we create. And I think we can start putting together some of the best practices around that. Because it's not a simple, you're right, it's not a simple solution. And I'm not proposing that it is. But I think it offers some real opportunities in a number of your communities to add interesting units. My wife and I may do this in the near future. We thought, rather than Airbnb, we should rent to a student at Durham uh, Community College. Or maybe somebody who's a resident general. Somebody who, you know, will be there, uh, will be somebody that could uh, occasionally feed our dogs when we're out, that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's some of it's what you do with the law and some of it's your intention of how you use it. But I think it is complicated, but we would be more than happy at MTC and APEC to work with you and figure it out. That's my point. Okay, I have a question over here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming and sharing this uh, with us today. Uh, I'm here to represent Marin City, and I don't see many people here from Marin City. Uh, we really have the only PDAs left uh, for housing region ones in Southern Marin. So I'm happy to hear that several of you do live in Marin. And I was talking with Brian Crawford about the possibility of the CSD um, bringing another one of these conversations to the community of Marin City um, so that the people there could respond. I think I just want to comment that often a silo, silo issue between our professionals and the people who are actually affected by the policies. I think it would be a great equity step in this county to have some of you folks who are on MTC and ABAG come and help us uh, put together a presentation where we might have something like this in Marin City. Thank you so much. Thank you for that suggestion. Okay, question over here from Bill. Uh, good morning. Um, another, the other PDA uh, is in uh, downtown San Rafael around the stationery. And I wanted to second the, uh, the Johnny's Donuts uh, drift of discussion, uh, a great addition to an existing Main Street. And following up on the, on the call for more, a more visionary approach, you know, I think when you look at Marin County, we have a solution already embedded in our traditional uh, town centers. And so I think you're, I'm hearing kind of uh, emphasis on the big cities, you know, big traditional cities in the Bay Area. I think if that can be complemented with also an emphasis on traditional uh, downtowns and town centers, and how to really attract uh, housing development in particular, which can help revitalize those centers and really reinforce their uh, roles as transit as well. So I, I mentioned your comments on how, uh, you know, maybe the PDA criteria could be supplemented by a downtown criteria that would weight some of the kind of incentives that you're providing towards downtowns uh, in addition to PDAs. Well, I think we're, we're always interested in, um, in, in looking at the PDAs and trying to figure out what comes next in terms of that framework. And I think for the next plan, we want to take a really good look at the PDAs. I just think what I would say is that you know, most of the PDAs around the region um, are downtown. Um, that is primarily the focus. Uh, there are areas that are close generally to high quality transit. Um, and then also, you know, hopefully housing. There's not too many of them up here in Marin. They are locally nominated. So there's not, you know, it's obviously it's not something that MTC and ABAG sort of prescribe down to you um, from a top level. There are some modest incentives to PDAs in terms of transportation funding. Not a lot, but some in terms of the OBAG uh, program. Um, but I think, you know, generally, hopefully this helps answer your question, I think we 
want to take a good look at everything that PE is, um, both in terms of the market potential of them, um, how we focus them. I think I agree with you in terms of it's not just big cities, it's also downtowns all around um, this region, how we can issue the sea level rise, the whole thing. Um, and I think that's really where we've got to evolve. Now, before we take the next question, you might want to uh, talk a little bit about where the role of the transit priority area is also playing with respect to the plan that are not, not self nominated. Well, transit priority areas or, or TPAs are embedded in um, essentially the SB 375 uh, legislation. Um, so those are areas that we uh, have to analyze um, as part of our um, environmental impact report. Um, so those are TPAs are, are areas typically with, with you know really high quality transit, not just a bus, but really that frequency um, that, that kind of makes it go. You know, we could put a focus more on TPAs. This region has decided to um, really look at PDAs, um, which are different. I think part of that is just the fact that they're locally nominated to be driven with the bottoms up. Um, where the TPA is, I think, also an important sort of way that we can analyze the plan, uh, but something that's more baked into state legislation rather than something that's uh, bubbling up from the locals. Yeah. Renee?
to have a regional conversation that combines transportation and land use. We think that makes sense. Um, but you know, that being said, we're also living under the rules that are created by the federal and state government. Um, so we do these plans every four years um, because the state of California and the federal government require us to do that. Um, I don't want to make it seem like we're only doing it because it's a requirement, but that's the reality that we're living under in terms of federal and state law. Yeah, I have, I have okay, next question, question. Uh, Renee. Renee, next question. Sorry. Very quickly, I think one of the most significantly affecting constituencies affected by Plan Bay Area 2014 are folks like me that basically commute over 10 miles per day with the workers. And I see a lot of people here who are staff or who are elected officials. Can I see a show of hands? For those people here who commute over 10 miles a day who are heavily affected by traffic. Show of hands. I think they're underrepresented. That's a significant number of people. What are you doing outreach-wise to make sure that that highly affected stakeholder group is proportionally represented in this plan? That, um, in terms of the outreach, obviously we're trying to get as many people out to all the meetings that we can, but we also recognize that people have pretty busy lives. So we also, uh, we generally do uh, telephone polls or other sort of um, online surveys to try to make sure that we are representing all constituents, uh, those that can come to meetings, those that can't, to really understand you know, how they feel about their commute, how they feel about you know, what's important, what are the biggest issues in the Bay Area. So, you know, we're trying to take a multi-pronged strategy to outreach and getting input from people because we recognize that, you know, there are a lot of diverse perspectives, a lot of different uh, commute patterns, a lot of different uh, needs in the region, and not everyone can show up to an in-person meeting. So we definitely do more uh, than this to try to make sure we're getting that perspective as well. And I did also want to mention, um, Richard, that um, as the APAC representative from Ren for all the cities, the women cities, I've encouraged each of the APAC delegates and alternates in each of those cities to bring the plan to their city councils um, or their governing body um, in order to be able to uh, provide comments to MTC and APAC, uh, but also for an opportunity for their communities to give input to them as well. Um, I know that the Board of Supervisors have their um, public, uh, their meeting on Plan Bay Area, I believe it was last week, um, and the motto, and we're having ours on Tuesday, um, and formulated our comments, so I'm hoping that some of the other cities are doing the same thing. The other thing I wanted to mention is that this is the only venue, uh, this is the only place in the Nine County Bay Area where, with the open house, we're also having a public workshop where there are presentations and an opportunity for a dialogue back and forth. And I just encourage you, next time we have one in Marin, hopefully next year, um, to bring all the people that you know um, so that we can have that opportunity for that dialogue. We have another question from Margaret over here. Thank you. Oh, you used the phrase parking potential of PDAs. Well, the really problem is parking varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. The opportunities themselves are set. I have been living in, uh, and many people do in Southern Marin, in urban communities which have hilly, narrow streets with insufficient parking, parking pre-existing maybe for one home, and that home now can be used for a B&B and, &B and has been so a neighborhood parking intrudes throughout the community of homes. When you talk about the potential of the uh, affordable housing, $8,000 when I last worked on a committee, which is many years ago, the parking, removing the parking space saved $8,000. So it was important for affordable housing to lose parking because nearby transportation would accommodate that. The people that live in the nearby communities depend upon, in our area, construction, and I can't recall it. So second thing, but each one uh, requires parking individually with the homeowners for service, bring their 
equipment, the construction people go individually to the communities. There need to be community parking areas. There need to be staging grounds for construction. And you need to plan those kinds of things. Not assume that because people are uh, working in, in communities of unaffordable housing, that they don't need transportation, they need it even more than the people. Thank you for that. So on the question of parking, I think there's some really interesting creative solutions out there. When you're dealing with families, with workforce families, or low-income families, it's hard to ask somebody to go to Safeway on a bus and carry back eight bags of groceries. But what some developers have done is, by, they ask for reduced parking, but they put car share cars in the building. So that a family doesn't have to own a second car, but there's always a car there when they need it to go to Safeway to buy groceries and come home. So I think there's some interesting best practices we can talk about to make better use of the parking spaces that we do have in those kinds of situations. I agree that when you ask families to go to Safeway on the bus, that's a lot to ask. Or if they have young kids that have to take somebody from school to you know, basketball practice or dance lessons or whatever, it's hard to do that on the bus. But if you can provide a car when they need a car, but not at the full cost of owning a car. That's, I think, a really great solution that several for-profit and non-profit developers have come up with. Okay, I have a question over here. Hi, I'm uh, Scott Lane, the Metropolitan Transportation Policy Advisory Council. There's actually a couple of us here in the room. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for everyone for being here. I think, uh, to answer one of the person's questions, I think the more dialogue and planning that we go on is better. Maybe if there's a way to describe the 30,000 foot level, what MTC and ABAC does, because the TAM project that you talked about, maybe there should have been a specific EIR to that. So in the South Bay where I'm at, part of the issue is the city does not do regional EIRs and does not work with other cities, much less specific EIRs. So we have developments popping up like mushrooms all over the place and people are really frustrated. But we're talking not 8,000 people, we're talking, you know, 20, 30,000 units are going to come in between now and 2040. So it's a different scenario. Well, so what people need to realize is there's 2 million more people going to be in the area. MTC and ABAC, I think, are just there trying to be the, the messenger to say, how do we deal with this in the best practice way? Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here. But we need to also support our politicians to give them ideas. The more active we are, the better the work results are going to be. Are there any other questions? Oh, yes. Um, let's go over here. If you stand up, just take your name. Hi, my name is Palacia. I live in Forest Knowles. Um, I just want to acknowledge out loud that right now, we as a human species live unsustainably. And these good people have put a ton of work into a plan that's attempting to get us more toward a more sustainable community, so I want to appreciate this phenomenal amount of work that's gone into this thinking. Um, and so in an unsustainable uh, world, human value, it's really hard to have a sustainable community, a sustainable Bay Area. And I wanted to ask if um, there's three resources that I'm familiar with, but I'm wondering if they have influenced the thinking of this plan to date. One is the International Living Future Institute and the Living Communities Challenge. Um, they're based in Seattle. They also have the Living Building Challenge. Um, it's an example of something that's very outside the box, very forward thinking, a leap beyond lead. Um, and also uh, this, the um, Paul Hawkins group, the book that just came out, Draw Down and This Plan. Um, uh, drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. Um, and they say it's the most comprehensive plan ever because there is no other plan that they've been able to find. <laughs> um, so that's another one. And some of the things they talk about are the, you know, very much at the top, empowering women and girls and um, family planning type initiatives. Um, so I'm just wondering if some of these sort of more out of the box cutting edge things have influenced some of the plans that you guys have been putting together. Uh, and then the final thing is systems thinking models and if any of systems thinking models have influenced um, the planning. Thank you. I, I think the many of us in the plan are, are influenced by a lot of the things you're talking about. Um, I, I think a 
lot of us that work on this every day are very curious in terms of ways that we could um, make this process more meaningful for everyone. Um, I, one, of the, one of the things that we, we toy with a lot, my, my staff and I toy with, is, is the idea of creating scenarios for our plans in a much different way, where um, we're actually trying to, to look at sort of things that are kind of like happening to us, um, whether or not, you know, so dealing with things like risk and uncertainty more in, in our scenarios, whether it has to do with um, sea level rise issues, hazards, earthquakes, financial calamity, really, I mean, it's, it's really resilience planning. It's kind of taking resilience and building it into everything we do. Um, so it's not necessarily sort of like a program that we're talking about over on the side. It actually infiltrates um, the way that we're doing planning. So I think there's a bit of a, a, a sea change that we're thinking about in terms of the way that we kind of construct these scenarios and alternatives and how we uh, move the public through that so we can have a more meaningful dialogue about the choices that we face. Um, and so to a lot of these big pressing issues that are kind of coming our way. Renee. Mm -hmm. David. I thought there were more answers up there. Um, David, in our corporate director. I generally like what I'm hearing today, but I'm confused, and I'm sure it's because I have intellectual limitations. Um, earlier in the earlier panel, Matt said that Plan Bay Area does not determine transportation funding. It does, not, it does not directly fund projects. It does not directly fund of course, as a, as a taxpayer, I'd love to have the coordination of business and housing development be coordinated with investments in transportation so that they're more efficient. And I think generally you work towards that. And I love the particulars of the action plan that Alex mentioned, affordability, displacement, particularly issue here in Denver, and access to jobs. But if you could just get a little bit more specific about how does all this planning activity translate into real decisions with real money that will affect the built environment? I, I think it would be helpful for me anyway. Thank you. Alex? Well, so in terms of this question about you know, does the plan fund projects or not, I mean, the, the plan is over a really long period of time. You know, until 2040. So it does set forth an investment strategy with the $300 billion. But when I did my little whirlwind funding tour, which you weren't expected to catch all that, but those were sort of the more near-term funding programs uh, that we have at our disposal to try to invest in these projects. Now, when we do take actions, uh, either us or the state, um, and certainly if it's us, uh, MTC, we basically are investing in projects that are consistent with our plan. So when we actually take those actions, it's a subsequent action to program money, allocate money, and give someone the check. But we do look to the plan that we have right now. When we adopt this plan, we'll look to this plan, and we'll make sure that when this near-term money comes, uh, whether it's the federal money through the One Bay Area Grant Program, whether it's um, other state funds that we have, whether it's original funds, that we are investing in the transportation projects that we said we would in the plan. So there's a there's a link there. It's just not that you know we don't write the checks when we approve the plan. It takes a subsequent action. So I don't know if that's part of your question, but I know it's your question's more than that. I'm not sure um, the second part is done. I'd also say that, that we we've been talking up here today mostly about public investment in housing and transportation. But I think the staff at both ABEG and MTC often have experience in other sectors of the economy. So a number of us have worked in the foundation world, in the private sector, and I think what we're hoping to do through a dialogue like uh, some of the ones that are about to start is to engage those people and get them to think in a different way and adopt some of the best practices that we've been talking about. So it won't all be public money. It could be private money, foundation money, to implement initially pilot projects around transportation ideas and housing ideas, and then that would influence bigger investments, public investments, and private investments later. So I think there's a number of ways for us to bring resources and ideas with you to the table and try to get some of those things funded, at least initially as pilot projects that we're in. And if they're successful, use them as best practices around the region. We're going to take two more questions, and Jim. Jim? 
Yes, uh, I believe, in, first my name is Jim Andrews. In urban sim, I believe you've collected uh, parcel level zoning information. Have you also included it in urban sim FEMA level flood information? And when you're doing your planning, why are you including flood zone areas as potential uh, development locations? We, we build into our modeling and any and all information that we get our hands on. Um, so in terms of zoning, local ordinances that are also there, um, those are also built in. Um, in. In terms of the whether the flood zone areas are built into urban sim, I have to get back to you on that specific question. Um, but I mean, obviously, I think we're hearing a lot of this today, the fact that the inundation from sea level rise is it's a real issue that we're facing in the future to make sure that we build it into our planning in a more direct way. Um, you know, ABAC's got a, a whole book of data over there. <laughs> it runs the resilience program in ABAC. Um, and uh, so we're, we're taking these issues very seriously and doing a lot of work on it. Okay, we're going to take one more question and then I'll get around that. Uh, David Schoenbrunn, Transdef. Uh, at the earlier panel, Stephanie mentioned that uh, problems of congestion, et cetera, are a problem all up and down the West Coast. However, some parts of the West Coast have come up with more effective solutions. For example, Portland has succeeded in a substantial decrease in uh, VMT per capita. The uh, proposed plan uh, has a VMT per capita that is absolutely flat. And what that says, it's within the margin of error of and what that says is that the land use strategy is doing nothing to change how people uh, travel. The mode split stays absolutely flat within the margin of error of the model. So this is a very much status quo plan that doesn't change anything and the results are what you would expect. Namely, you cram more people onto the same roads, you have worse congestion. So the implication is that the plan is simply not accomplishing making the future better. Comment. Well, from the perspective of BMT per capita, the plan is achieving between 15 and 16 percent. So we are seeing a reduction. Not part of that. Actually, part of not true. Well, part part of that is from land use. Part of it is from funding. Now, you're talking GHG. I said VMT per capita. Okay, well, well, GHG per capita is largely built on VMT per capita. No, it isn't. Well, the way that we calculated the, the SB375, um, so I mean, it, we also include not only the, the GHG from the land use and the transportation scenarios, but also uh, the climate initiatives program. As I showed a slide earlier, too, I think it's important to remember that. What we can do in this plan is only a subset of everything we can do in terms of uh, emissions reductions from mobile sources. Um, you know, one thing that we don't account for in those calculations is the fact that our fleets are getting cleaner and that we have federal and state standards in place to do that. That's really where the big bang for the buck is. When we actually go through our travel model, we're actually not allowed to account for that. The SB375. So that's, that's also a huge chance. VNT is rising based upon the population also rise. And so in order to corral VNT and make it go down, not only just a per capita basis, but overall, um, I mean, I think we really need to think about hugely transformative solutions. It's exactly. And, and this plan doesn't. Okay, we have one more question over here. If I could just also speak to your question. I think, again, this is the reason we do this plan every four years, because I think you will see get into detail about this after the panel if you want, some major changes in the next four years that allow for some things that we accept now to be happening to maybe change. If we were doing this plan once and expecting it to be good for 40 years, that would be laughable. But we don't. We do this, and it's part of the law. We have to redo it every four years. So I think we will see between now and the next plan some interesting changes in a number of things that may make this conversation somewhat different a few years from now. And that's my response. 
I think that's going to happen. Last question, Renee. My name is Vina Flores, I'm from Novato, and I'd like to thank MTC for coming today on a Saturday. We're the only open house in the nine Bay Area counties, and I'd like to, and ABAG, and I'm thanking ABAG, specifically Pat Edlin, for arranging this open house and public meeting. She's done all the outreach for the event and shows the location, which I appreciate very much. I also want to encourage MTC to think locally and help us with our local regional uh, planners to think outside the box. In neighborhoods such as uh, Canal neighborhood of San Rafael, we have many families living in a single apartment. If we were able to entice the builders to build some communal living, perhaps it would help ease the problems. So there are areas in which MTC can drill down and work with us locally specifically for our county, it would be great if you could dip down and speak to us directly. We are unique here in Marin County. We're like no other county in the Bay Area, and we have unique opportunities to think outside the box and make positive changes while maintaining our local integrity. Dennis, do you want to wrap things up? So I want to thank the panel for uh, your excellent Thank you for taking questions and thank you for spending your Saturday with us. I want to thank you all for coming.